one of the sure ways to go boring at the beginning of a teaching or a lesson or preaching is to say, Webster says, uh, wow, that will put them to sleep right off the bat. But I want to risk that in this particular session because we just need to, if we're going to study parables, uh, be able to define what we're talking about. Uh, that will even determine how many parables we look at in the gospel record. Scholars have suggested there are about 40 different parables of Jesus. Interestingly enough, there are about 40 different miracle stories as well. So those words and deeds of Jesus in miracles and parables kind of go together, if you will. The deeds back up the words and the words explain the deeds, all of that sort of thing. But um, what do we mean by this? Because a parable could simply be a, a, a metaphoric uh, phrase. It could be just a figure of speech, or it could go a lot deeper than that and be more anecdotal and a story. So what do we mean by the word parable? I want to deal with that in this particular uh, teaching. And so let's just put that up here uh, right away. Parable, parable. That's a compound word. It's not a very long word, but para or para means beside. And then this last part is from a Greek verb, baleo or balo, which means to throw or to cast. So you've got the idea of throwing something and you've got the idea of beside something when you talk about a parable. And that's what it is. At its simplest, a parable is sort of a comparison of sorts. Think of it this way, that Jesus wants to teach us something about the love of God, or Jesus wants to teach us something about the kingdom of God, or Jesus wants to teach us something about how people in the kingdom live and think and work and witness. Well, to do that, he will throw down alongside of the truth he's trying to illustrate, some kind of story. And thus, you know, parable, parabole, a thrown down alongside of something. And thus the word comparison. At the real basis of parable study is some kind of comparison. But we need to take that just a little bit further if we can. And that is the second thing I would add to the definition of parable being something thrown down alongside of something else, a comparison, is that these parables of Jesus are so often anecdotal. Anecdotal. That is to say, they are story-like. And let me just back up to an old uh, definition that if you hung around church very much or Sunday school, you might have heard. It's the old definition that parables are an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, early on in my life, I accepted that. That made sense to me. Jesus had some heavenly truth to teach. He puts it low to the ground so we can understand it. And then as I grew in my faith, I sort of jettisoned that definition. I thought that's not very accurate. That doesn't take us very far. And then in more recent years, I've come back to it to sort of embrace it and think, well, maybe there's more to it than I thought because at least in contrast to the Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, all of those sects of Judaism, they would tell parables, but they were more what we would call proverbs. Short, pithy statements of general truth. They weren't these elaborate stories that are told. Just like in the New Testament, the epistles of the New Testament, even the shorter ones, are longer than typical letters of uh, the day. Uh, Philemon, Jude, those were more typical of the length. Well, the New Testament letters take the idea of letter and just make it deeper, richer, sweeter, fuller. Jesus does the same thing with parables. He will uh, just say, okay, we wanna talk about neighbor? Like in Luke chapter 10, when the lawyer says, but who is my neighbor? Jesus could have said, well, your neighbor, uh, the Hebrew word for neighbor is, and the 14 Chaldean cognates are, and you better take notes because we're on a test on Tuesday. But instead he says, well, neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. I'll tell you what, a man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and as he did, he fell among thieves. And they robbed him and stripped him, left him for dead. <laughs> he tells a story. It's anecdotal. The point is that probably if Jesus has an antecedent, which we will talk about, if he had an antecedent for his stories, it probably goes back to the narrative prophets. 
not just to the Proverbs, but to the narrative prophets. It's not kind of like the Hebrew word mashal. Mashal is the word for parable, but it just also can just mean a short, pithy statement of general truth. The book of Proverbs does this all the time, for instance. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's a parable in the sense that it's proverbial. It's a wise saying. And by the way, Roy Zook in his book, Basic Bible Interpretation, gives six different interpretations of that. What we have to remember is that Proverbs are not promises. They're short, pithy statements of general truth. But they would fit under the umbrella, biblically, of parable. If you understand that parables can be short figures of speech, but also longer stories. One of the things we notice about the parables of Jesus, when we're defining them, is that they're longer stories. So it is a comparison. It's some kind of truth thrown down alongside of a story, or vice versa, the story alongside the truth. And sometimes it's teased out. It's got some dynamics to it. There's one of the parables of Jesus, for instance, in Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. It could end four times. You could come to a logical conclusion four different times in those 14 verses of where the story could end, but Jesus just teases it out. It's almost like he takes a trajectory and just keeps going with it. One of the things that's kind of exciting to do at times in parable study is to what we call extend the parable. Extend the parable. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. One of my seminary professors in my Illinois days uh, preached in chapel one time on the parable of the, Pro of the Good Samaritan. That's really familiar territory. And so anyway, he decided he would extend the story to make it more anecdotal. And the way he chose to do it was kind of to trick the audience. He said, well, Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. But that's not the end of the story. Well, of course, it is the end of the story in the text. The next event in the life of Jesus is about Mary and Martha and Mary studying at Jesus' feet and Martha being upset because she wasn't helping in the kitchen. That's the next thing. But, but this teacher, this professor, decided to make it more anecdotal, to extend it a little bit. So he said, we've actually found an ancient piece of literature. It's kind of like a, a textual variant, kind of piece of papyri that tells the rest of the story. That the guy who fell among thieves while recuperating in the inn did get well. And do you know where he went? The very first place he went, he went back to Samaria. And he searched church after church after church trying to find that good Samaritan. And finally, he found the good Samaritan at this one church. And do you know what that man who fell among thieves did? He transferred his membership into that church. He said, boy, if this is where the Good Samaritan goes, that's the kind of church I want to be part. See what he's doing? Obviously, he's taking some liberty with the biblical parable of the Good Samaritan, but that's not the point. Jesus' stories are anecdotal. So there's a sense in which we can kind of return to the old Sunday school definition and not be wide of the mark, that it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So a parable is a comparison of some kind, one way or another, that's at its root. It's also anecdotal, but I need to add a third thing about this definition, and that is, it is a true to life story, a true to life comparison. That is to say, it starts out in reality, the world as we know it. When Jesus said, a sower went forth to sow, immediately you think, okay, that's a farmer, I get that. It corresponds to our world. Even if my farming idea in Iowa with a John Deere tractor was one image, I still get the, it corresponds to reality. It's true to life. Now the guy that made this famous is a fellow by the name of J. Robertson McQuilkin in a book called Understanding and Applying the Bible. For years, McQuilkin was the president of Columbia International University in Columbia, South Carolina, and kind of had a missionary context to his life. What's interesting about his own life is that his wife got Alzheimer's and he resigned the presidency to take care of her because he said she's more agitated when I'm away from her and more at ease when I'm with her. And it's a very beautiful love story. But McQuilkin says, you need to understand that these parables weren't just fantasy. Now, I will argue that they leap to fantasy at some point in the story, which is a very significant part of the teaching. But they start out true to life. They correspond to reality. These are not stories that people would have heard them and gone, oh, that never happens. A man had two sons, and the younger said, give me my share of the state. 
I'm leaving. That happens. He shamed his father in that society, but it happens. The man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and as he did, he fell among thieves. That was very true to life. Because that's a 17 and a half mile journey from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It drops 3,700 feet in the Midwest of the United States. You'd have to go clear across the state of Kansas to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, imitate that kind of uh, uh, drop. But that's in 440 some miles. 17, so robbers and thieves hid out in the caves and the caverns of that road that went from Jerusalem to Jericho. In other words, even though it's a made up story, it corresponds to reality. And that's a very important part of the teaching. These are not just fairy tales that Jesus is telling. They start enough with reality to get us there. Now, let me mention a fourth item about this comparison, and that is this. There is, there is fourthly speaking, sort of uh, at some point, this true-to-life comparison will kind of leave you dumbfounded. Dumbfounded. So I've got to include that sort of in the in the definition, if you will, of this. Um, you're reading along the story that Jesus tells, and all of a sudden something seems strangely out of whack. It's just that you think, now wait a minute, it started out true to life, but that detail doesn't seem to make sense. Let me give you an example. Uh, in the final week of Jesus' life, what we typically call in Life of Christ Studies, the day of questions. Uh, Jesus has gotten these questions and he's basically come down to say, I'm not going to answer your question. But then he sort of does indirectly through parables. <laughs> and one of the parables that he tells is about a guy who had a vineyard and the owner went away for a long time, which by the way, the parables anticipate that the owner, if that's Christ or God, that we expect a delay in him coming back. That may have something to do with the second coming and all of that. So he stays away. When it comes time for harvest, he sends some of his servants to get the harvest. Well, the tenant farmers who are working the vineyard for the owner who's away, they see these servants coming and they mistreat them and they beat them. And one they wound in his head and uh, they kill some. And this happens repeatedly over and over. And then the owner of the vineyard says, I will send my son. They will respect my son. Now that's where the story goes from true to life to dumbfounded. No way. I mean, I have two sons of our four children. Two of them are sons. And even on a bad day, I wouldn't send those two rascals into, you know, the turkey vultures. They're going to rip their heads off like these tenant farmers. That doesn't make any sense. So why would you do that? Well, I took the liberty to ask that question one day. One of my teachers at Denver Seminary was a guy named Dr. Haddon Robinson. And I said, Dr. Robinson, sometimes the parables don't make sense to me. They, they, they just, they, they, it's like they're going along true to life, corresponding to reality, but then there's some wacky thing. What dad in his right mind, what landowner would send his son? He knows these pack of wolves are going to, in fact, they do. The son comes, they kill him. In fact, they throw him outside the vineyard. That's a very important teaching. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus was crucified outside the city. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Does Jesus write himself into his own stories? That's a whole nother ball of wax. But why would, and that's when Dr. Robinson said, well, Mark, he said, that's the point. He said, when the story moves from true to life to dumbfounded, like this doesn't make sense. That's when the grace of God, the love of God has entered the story. Okay, in other words, this definition of parable has to include comparison. It's usually teased out anecdotally. It's a story. It's a true to life comparison. It starts in reality, but at some point in the parable, not all of them, but many of them make you go, eh, blah, blah, blah. You just, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand that. Why would this happen? The, the familiar one, and we just keep this as our default setting in these lessons, the parable of the prodigal son, that he found a level of repentance in the pig pen, and he records his little tape recorder speech. I'm going to go home to my father. I'm going to say to my father, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. And he gets there, and the father sees him and runs to him and... You expect it to say, and beat the tar out of that boy. You expect it to say, he, he, he just let the people pebble this boy with stones because he brought financial ruin on his family in a shame and on their culture. Instead, the wildest thing happens. He 
hugs this boy. He kisses this boy. He throws a party for this boy. It doesn't make sense. But it does make sense because you've moved from true to life to a world of fantasy. And it's in the fantasy world where you are dumbfounded that the love of God and the grace of God has entered the story. So you've got to get this as part of your definition, if you will. Now, uh, fifth thing uh, is just what I would say uh, is kind of a definition from a scholar that I mentioned earlier. And that is a guy named C.H. Dodd. C.H. Dodd, I think, has put these first four elements all together for us in his definition of parable. When he suggests that, yes, the parable can jump from true to life to fiction, if you will, something strange is happening there. And Dodd put it all together, I think, with this kind of definition. It's been hard to improve on this. I've tried through the years to give my own little you know, taste of this. It's a true to life comparison that can leave you dumbfounded, but open to the possibilities of the dynamic reign of God in your life. But I want to read for you C.H. Dodd's definition because nobody since he wrote it in 1935 have been able to, has been able to improve it. Here it is. At its simplest, the parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness, now listen to the last part, and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into active thought. Now that's really full. Got to break that down a little bit to these pieces, but I think you'll see that Dodd's definition is incorporating the rest of these parts that we've talked about in terms of uh, defining a parable. At its simplest, he says, the parable is a metaphor or a simile. The kingdom of heaven is like, that's a simile. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That's a metaphor. At its basic, it's a comparison. It's a, it's a figure of speech. That's a comparison. So at its root, at its simplest, it's that. And it's usually drawn from nature, common life. One of the things we like about the stories of Jesus is there's something for everybody. When I, my default setting is sports. So if it was just left to me, all my sermon illustrations would be about the Denver Broncos. But that doesn't go very far for us. So, so um, Jesus had something for everybody. Uh, he, he had a woman kneading dough. He had a man fishing with a fishing pole or a fishing net. He had a man sowing seed. He had a, a boy being rebellious against his father. He had workers in the vineyard. He, in the preaching of Jesus, there was something for everybody. He was very democratic in how he went about this. So these parables that are anecdotal, that are kind of, they, 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 they oftentimes will be drawn from nature or common life. And then they often arrest the hearer by vividness or strangeness. They arrest the hearer by vividness or strangeness. In other words, there's some point at which they will be dumbfounding. And then he says, leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into active thought. In other words, with parable study, it's sort of a day late and a dollar short. It's sort of you get the idea later. You get kind of a Christian twitch or a jerk that happens to you later on. Jesus tells them, I think, with that intention. Let, let me illustrate it this way. Let's take the parable of the sower for just a minute. That one, Jesus said, is the key to understanding all the others. You don't understand that one, you won't understand the others. So a man goes forth to sow, and as he sowed, some fell on, you know, uh, hard soil, some on thorny soil, some on rocky soil, some on good soil. Now that's the story. So here's the idea to get our arms around this definition. Here is a guy named Levi. All right, he's a Jewish husband and father, and uh, he is married to Jochebed. So Levi and Jochebed are husband and wife, and here's their little son, Aaron. So um, he's a farmer, he sows seed, and uh, he comes to his wife, Jochebed, and said, you know, crops are doing pretty good. I think I'm gonna take Aaron with me today, and we're just gonna go out and listen to that Galilean preacher. And Jochebed says, no, you don't. You're not taking Aaron. Last time you took him with you, you forgot him. You left him there. We had to go back and get him. You don't watch. You don't pay attention. I'll watch him, Mama. Don't worry. No, you're not. I'll watch him. All right, she says, but you be home for dinner. So he, Levi, takes Aaron, and they go listen to Jesus preach. Well, they're there all day because Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, he preached a whole sermon one day in parables. 
And so they listen to Jesus. They come home. They get home in time for dinner. So Jochebed is happy. They sit down to eat their soup. And Jochebed says, well... And uh, Levi says, well, what? Well, was he a good preacher? And Levi says, well, I don't know if you'd call it preaching. He just kind of told stories. Jochebed says, well, were they good stories? Well, he says, yeah, I guess they were good stories. She said, well, what were they about? Well, uh, farmers and uh, fishers uh, and uh, people working in the kitchen and... Uh, he tells about the stories of Jesus. And then Jochebed really nails him. She says, well, what did the stories mean? And Levi says, uh, I don't know. She said, well, wow, that can't be good stories if you don't know what they mean. Well, I got to think about it. So he thinks about it. And two or three days later, he's out in his garden working away, hoeing the beans. And all of a sudden, he has that Christian twitch. He kind of wakes up. Jochebed! Jochebed! I don't think he's talking about dirt. I think he's talking about our hearts. You see what's happened there? Not just a simple comparison. A simple comparison that became a story, teased out. A simple comparison that starts out in real, true-to-life stuff. But then at some point, it breaks out to being, wow, a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold? A good harvest in Jesus' day was 15 fold. This is overwhelming kind of harvest for the good soil. There's something that, and that's why C.H. Dodd says, as to its precise application, it leaves the mind in sufficient doubt to tease it, to tease it into active thought. It was Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, who said that Jesus deceives us into truth. I'll have more to say about that later. I guess I would add one more thing on this list, and that is this. I mentioned it in our resources section, and it would be another name, and it is the name William Herzog, who once again says these speeches, once they get this far, these stories, once they get this far, to teasing the mind, they upset the apple cart. They turn it upside down. That's why when Jesus told some of these stories, they wanted to take him over to the brow of the hill and throw him off. Parables are hardly easy things to listen to. Sometimes they're comparisons that are stories that correspond to reality, but leave you going, I'm not sure I know what these mean. The definition of parable.